Hello everyone and welcome to the Design of the Space Shuttle, a series dedicated to the long and winding road that led to the development of NASA's Space Shuttle. What you see here is obviously not the Space Shuttle, this is actually the primordial space plane. This is Eugen Sanger's Silverbird, proposed in 1933 in his doctoral thesis, and it uses a skip glide technique in order to get to space and then circle around the globe. Now this probably wouldn't have really worked. In Kerbal Space Program, I had other difficulties. It was supposed to launch on a monorail with a booster attached to it. So the booster would stay on the monorail, but boost it to approximately 500 meters per second or 1,100 miles an hour. Doing so without a monorail is a little bit tricky. Of course, we could create an elaborate monorail in Kerbal Space Program, but I opted to just do a runway takeoff instead with the booster. So the rear end there is the booster. The engines we are using are basically the A4 engines. They are the engines on the V2 rockets that were used by Germany in World War II, and they would have been available to Sanger eventually. The Silverbird would not have had as many problems launching as I obviously did here, but it would have had problems because they simply didn't know the properties of the upper atmosphere, nor did they understand hypersonic design, hence the straight wing there. You see that is sort of reminiscent of like a V1 rocket or very early rockets, but uh, not very conducive to supersonic, much less hypersonic speeds. But the whole idea of bouncing off of the atmosphere is a much more difficult and dangerous than originally anticipated by Sanger, especially because of the heating involved. Now, this plane would not be going nearly as fast as a space shuttle, but still, it would be repeatedly encountering the atmosphere, and the atmosphere would not give uh, sufficient lift to allow for the skip glide technique with such a small wing. On this attempt with three A4 engines now on the booster, we finally managed to, well, get it off the ground. Uh, even though technically it was supposed to stay on a monorail, this is probably for the best. And we are accelerating well to 500 meters per second, which is our goal, 1,100 miles an hour or thereabouts. And there the booster is about to finish and separates cleanly but unfortunately the A4 engine's fuel is unsettled and it could not ignite. So we will have to pre-ignite the A4 engine before the booster separates. And so this is the next attempt. Unfortunately, vicissitudes of the runways of Kerbal Space Program hindered this particular attempt. Yes, uh, yeah, so... These tests were all done during a live stream on Twitch, by the way. And yes, the mayhem was very entertaining. Here we go again, and this time I'll just say right up front that we do meet with some success, so that's nice. Though not without problems, as you'll soon see. The booster gets us up to speed. But unfortunately, uh, the vehicle starts wiggling back and forth, and that leads to stress on the booster's uh, wheels, I believe. And so it explodes, but the plane is away and ignites its own engine successfully and now it is in flight so we decided to uh, take it where it was supposed to go according to the skip glide plan it was supposed to reach a height of 270 kilometers and approximately 6600 miles an hour and then it was supposed to descend on a glide down to 70 kilometers and then skip off the atmosphere back up to about 180 kilometers then it would descend again to an altitude of around 60 kilometers or 70, 60 to 70 kilometers and then skip up again and then do so repeatedly. Here we see that even though the booster didn't give us the full boost, it only got us to about 200 to 300 meters per second, we managed to get to an apoapsis of 176 kilometers and so the prediction of 270 kilometers seems accurate. Our horizontal velocity was not sufficient, though perhaps if we got the correct boost from the booster, it would have been. Now we didn't have an RCS system on board, and there was no indication in the design of an RCS system. I think to some extent there was a presumption that the atmosphere was quite a bit thicker and that the aerodynamic control surfaces would be sufficient, but it's possible that they would have eventually figured out that they needed an RCS system a reaction control system that would allow maneuvering in space. Still, as we encounter the atmosphere, our initial profile was correct, but the atmosphere forced us to prograde and to pitch down. You saw there, there was no way for me to pitch up 
uh, earlier. Uh, perhaps with an RCS system that would have helped, but overall, uh, the wing does not seem adequate and the pitch authority does not seem accurate to really do a skip glide with this particular design. Again, that's not unexpected because when this was designed in 1933 and fleshed out in the late 30s and early 40s, there was no knowledge of the upper atmosphere, its properties, nor anything about supersonic flight or hypersonic flight and so a lot of development was necessary. Eventually we did get reasonably far out uh, for what it's worth. Certainly not transcontinental or circling the globe, which was what it was intended to do, but perhaps with a different flight profile, improved engine design, perhaps a lighter body, it would have been good. Uh, we decided to have the pilot bail out and test out VNG parachutes the pilot uh, seemed to succumb to g-forces and was briefly knocked out but eventually the pilot woke up and the parachutes were deployed. I should mention at this point that much of the information I'm presenting is based on the book Space Shuttle Developing an Icon by Dennis R. Jenkins with supplementary sources of course but that provides the basic arc of the sort of story I'm telling. The next space plane was actually designed as a hypersonic research vehicle. It is the A-9, which is very explicitly based on the V-2. It's basically a V-2 rocket with wings strapped to it and a ramjet on the bottom. It was designed in 1944 and this A-9 was supposed to have an A-10 booster on its tail to get it up to space and make it a real space plane, but I could get no information on that booster, so right now we are just in hypersonic research mode with just the A-9 with no booster. So it has its A-4 engine, the usual V-2 engine which just went out there, and now it has its ramjet, but it was supposed to go into a ballistic trajectory, a very high trajectory, a high arc that would toss it up and then it would sort of do a pseudo skip glide thing similar to the Sanger Silverbird somewhat based on the Sanger Silverbird concept and the problem with that is the ramjet is not very efficient at uh, high altitudes because there's no air to suck in at the lower altitudes it was expected to operate uh, more efficiently and here you can see the thrust on the ramjet increasing but my flight profile was not ideal for this and eventually our thrust would tail off. Perhaps with the A-10 booster, that would guarantee that we'd be going at a high enough velocity that the ramjet would continue to function and we could get proper range with the A-9. But we didn't get very far out with this at all. But uh, still, so this is the basic design idea. You can see the resemblance to the V-2 rocket and basically the ramjet was strapped in place of the bottom fin and wings were strapped on the side and a proper cockpit was installed. It was enlarged of course, it had to be larger to accommodate the pilot. It was much larger than the V2 itself. The whole Sanger Silverbird skip glide boost glide idea was ultimately taken up by Bell Aircraft and we'll continue that story in a later video. Uh, the A9 rocket that you saw here was taken up by North American Aviation and developed into the Navajo missile and led to the development of Rocketdyne, which also ultimately made the Space Shuttle's engines. So each of these designs that I'm showing had a direct relationship to the development of the Space Shuttle. We're not just talking out of thin air with paper designs here, even though these were never actually launched. Each of these designs directly contributed to real ideas that were launched. And perhaps none was as iconic as Von Braun's Ferry Rocket, designed in 1951 and presented to the American public in a feature by Walt Disney. This was not merely a space plane, but a full space shuttle meant to go to orbit, conduct missions, and then return. Those missions would be building up a Mars fleet to go on an expedition to Mars. And its size was roughly two times the mass of a Saturn V rocket that Von Braun would eventually design to reach the moon. There are two booster stages prior to the actual space plane and those were meant to be recoverable using parachutes. And the full design would be much bigger than what you see here. So whether the parachutes would have worked to recover those is an open question. You see the huge fins on the first stage and that's to counterbalance the aerodynamics of the space plane itself. On the full-sized version, the first stage was supposed to have 51 engines, the second stage was supposed to have 34 engines, and the third stage was supposed to have 8 engines. It was supposed to burn nitric acid and hydrazine. We're using variants of those. 
and actually the engines on the space plane I have here are AJ-10 engines burning uh, UDMH, which is a variant of hydrazine, and inhibited white-fuming nitric acid, which is close enough. So Von Braun presented this particular design to the American public and to the world. You can see some echoes of this in the N1 rocket, though obviously not exact. And actually, the chief rocket designer for the Soviet Union, Sergei Korolev, also got his start in the 30s and 40s designing space planes first. And so this was a trend across the world, uh, Germans, Americans, as well as Russians, uh, starting out with space planes and only developing capsules because of the race to get to space and the need to fit budgets. This 1951 version of the ferry rocket was actually doing quite well, but we had overheating on the command core, which is actually the probe core that is supposed to allow this to be uncrewed. Uh, not very necessary since we have a crew member on board, a pilot on board, but uh, here it was sort of a structurally integral part and it was overheating on re-entry and this was not good. It also had a weakened reaction wheel, a realism of all reaction wheel. Not that powerful, but potentially helpful in maneuvering the vehicle and making sure it had the proper attitude on re-entry. But unfortunately, obviously not adequate heat shielding and so uh, the pod was left to the vicissitudes of aerodynamics. The canards on, on the cockpit were not in the right place to make it aerodynamically proper, and of course it had no yaw control to speak of. By this point though, the shuttle had already bled off a lot of velocity, and actually the cockpit managed to survive the remaining heating, and that allowed us to have our Kerbal bail out. Earlier on, uh, John and Cameron had had to bail out and did not survive that. I didn't make a mention of that, but at this point in the live stream, I was a little bit worried that the same would happen again, though it looked like this time at least the parachutes deployed properly. I guess on the previous attempt with the A9, uh, bailing out didn't work because we were at an insufficient height to open the parachutes properly. But uh, John Dunn was recovered, and I just wanted to show you the eventual development of the ferry rocket. This is in 1954, and what I wanted to point out is obviously they turned to Delta Wings finally. And this was after a lot of supersonic research, and they realized that a Delta Wing design would be uh, perhaps better than the canard configuration of the original ferry rocket. And so what you have here in 1954 is in Von Braun's mind, the design, the way to go in space is to have two recoverable stages using parachutes and a delta winged glider that would glide back down after conducting a mission in space. Obviously this would have echoes in the space shuttle program, but more directly it influences the X-20, the dinosaur program, which we will meet up in a later video. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to continue seeing this particular series, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.